Our God is a consuming fire, burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the holy righteous judge, ruling over us with kindness and wisdom, and we will keep our Fortress is our God, a sacred refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign. Our God is jealous for his own, none could Fortress is our God, a sacred refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign, so we will set our hearts on you. Lord, we will set our hearts on you. A mighty fortress is our God. A sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. Into the saving arms 
salvation songs. Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. It's what the Lord has done in me. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come? When I see my gracious Savior, Face to face when all is done Is that His voice I am hearing Come away, my precious one Is He calling me? Is He calling me? I will rise up, I'll rise My gracious Savior, face to face when all is done, is that His voice I am hearing, come away, my precious one, is He calling me, is He Sacrifice, oh, 
Boy, like you can't hack. Early to rise, early in the sack. Thank God I'm a country boy. 
Well, a simple kind of life never did me no harm. Raising me a family and working on a farm. Days are all filled with an easy country charm. Thank God I'm a country boy. Well, I got me a fine wife. I got me old fiddle. What to scare to his favorite fruit? A strawberry. <laughs> How are you supposed to talk in an Apple library? With your insider voice. Get it? Cider? <laughs> wow! Why did the farmer stand behind the horse? Because he thought he was going to get a kick out of it. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I don't have jokes as good as that, so I'm just going to leave it there. Can you all stay with me as we read this scripture together this morning? This is from Acts 14, verses 21 and 22. Let's read this together. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Can you bow your head and let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for a wonderful morning. It's beautiful outside and we're thankful for nature and uh, just the fact that we get to walk outside and see your power. And Father, we are mindful this morning um, that there are struggles um, that are outside these walls and also things that are bothering us when we come in. And Father, there is grief and hardship. And Father, I just pray that this morning as we gather together, we can strengthen one another through song, through the reading of your word, through the breaking of bread together, Father, that we carry each other's burdens and that we lift each other up this morning. And Father, most importantly, we get our strength from you and we remember that. Father, just as we read in the book of Acts, there's going to be many hardships that we go through. Um, that is something that we read about um, in your word. Father, we are mindful of that. And we are prayerful that you strengthen us and that we lean on you. Father, uh, as we come to you this morning, we pray that we remove all those things that are weighing us down. And Father, we pour our heart and our soul and our mind into our worship this morning. And through your son's precious name, amen. I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. My spirit is willing, but the flesh is so weak. Light the fire in my soul, fan the flame, make me whole. Lord, you know. Soldiers of 
Christ arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts, who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror, that having all things done. Strength will arise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will arise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong. Just take 
where imagination runs wild, where lessons are learned, and wonders are built. The table is where time can stop, where wounds are comforted, and freedom begins. where we find peace and we laugh till it hurts the table is where we gather with family new and old to share stories to nourish our bodies to enrich our souls table is where we give thanks and where we remember what great gifts we have been given. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is James Buse. I uh, was here a few m months ago, actually, and life has changed for a lot of us in a lot of ways. My wife and I uh, welcomed our second child uh, about three weeks ago. So we are navigating life as a uh, family of four. Our son is beginning to call his sister a sister, still not by her name. We'll call her sister, which is a, a step up from the first few days where he called her that baby over there. And so we are um, <laughs> glad to be here. So with all of that, my uh, family, I believe, in theory, is watching online, but I am sure that something has come up. And so uh, I do want to say thank you so much for uh, having me here. This is a great place to be and, and just to be a part of everything that's going on here. And so anyway, I'm just glad to be a part of this service this morning. Again, my name is James Buse. I was here a few months ago, but I grew up here at Saturn Road. It's a part of my story. This church, this space is a part of who I am. And so I'm grateful to have the opportunity to come back and to talk with you. Over the last few weeks, from what I understand, uh, you've been talking about worship, having this conversation about worship. Michael Felker came in, Stephen, uh, Stephen Pine spoke, as well as the Kevins, who also engaged with the idea of worship and what worship is. And this morning, we're going to continue in that theme and the idea of worship. But as you could probably tell in the video, we're going to be talking about an element, a specific part of our worship, and that is the communion table, the time that we gather, that we break bread, and we spend time together. And so I want to do my best on speaking to that. I will tell you that communion is a very intimidating topic if you've ever had the opportunity to speak toward communion. I can talk about a lot of things, but communion is one of those elements, one of those times that's very intimidating to me. I don't know why, probably because it's so much bigger than me, and so many people have spoken about it. It's caused divisions, it's caused uh, debates, it's caused so many things, and yet we have about 25 minutes to unpack this table that has changed the shape of the world as we know it. And so I will try to do my best to do this conversation justice, but I want to let you know that just the concept of communion is intimidating. 
I think it's intimidating for a lot of us in a lot of ways because whenever we speak about communion, we talk about a table, we talk about these different elements, these different moments, but really what does that mean and what does that look like? The day was November 7th, 1999. I remember because it was the first time I can actually recall being nervous going to church. Before that, the feelings that I had for go, uh, in my attendance for church were usually frustration, tired, irritability. You can ask my parents. I'm sure that they would confirm all of those feelings. But on this particular Sunday, I remember being nervous. Because this was the first Sunday where I was official. The week before, the Sunday night, I would made the decision to be baptized and to be part of God's story and to be a part of this, this family, this body of believers. So this upcoming Sunday, that seventh, was the day that I got to sit at the table for the first time. I remember being nervous for two very specific reasons. One, it was, the, uh, it was my first time to do it. I was excited, I was energized, so I was nervous about messing it up. I know we've all heard horror stories of people messing up communion, and I didn't want to do that at the very least on my very first attempt at joining everybody in this party. The second was we weren't on our home turf. My family and I were visiting family in another town, and so I wasn't here seated with you all, so I didn't understand the way the system was going to work, so I was very anxious going into it that morning. I remember this morning, that morning, I went and I was wearing one of my favorite pairs of pants. It was a white pleated corduroy pair of pants because in the 90s I was the peak of fashion even then and so I had those pants and I remember going and just sitting anxiously waiting for the Lord's Supper to come this this time that I'm there because this is the Sunday this was the moment where I had the opportunity to take my first legal communion and I say legal communion because I can finally admit it after all of the years here. There were plenty of Wednesday nights where after having probably fifth grade class upstairs, my friends and I would sneak down to the communion prep room, which was not well guarded, so not on us. And we would sneak some of the crackers. And although we didn't take any grape juice, we'd had grape juice before, there was something about that flavorless matzah cracker that we took, and we would go hide in different parts of the church and break the bread and practice communion together. We would take larger portions than normally on a Sunday morning, <laughs> but we would. And I always felt guilty, so it's good to finally get that off of my chest. Thank you for this confession times with James. But we... This Sunday, I had that chance and that opportunity. There were plenty of times growing up I watched the plate get passed. I asked my parents if I could have it. They would say no, and they would keep passing the tray. It wasn't because they were flouting their ability for this midweek snack. It was more, um, I wasn't ready. But this Sunday, I was. This Sunday, I finally had a seat at the table. And I remember sitting as the, the trays, or the, the, it was time for communion, and the men got up, they passed the trays down, and I remember sitting there thinking, okay, what is going to happen? How can I do this? And I got nervous. I started shaking a little bit. Nothing too big, just a little bit of anxiety was flowing through me, a lot of energy, a lot of adrenaline, because this was the time, this was the moment. And so the tray passed, the bread came to my row, and it started passing down, and I took it, broke the bread, passed it, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be honest, I knocked it out of the park. I was built for that moment. I took the correct amount of cracker, like I didn't have to do one of those double breaks, you know what I'm saying? I got the one break, passed it along, took it, it was fantastic. But that's when everything started to unravel quickly for me. You see, because the cracker is the easier of the two elements if it's your first time partaking in, in, in the Lord's Supper, if you haven't seen it. And so they, they pass the tray, it's time for the juice to come down, and we begin passing the tray that's there, and I remember thinking, okay... I'm shaking, I'm nervous, what am I going to do? Just don't mess it up, just don't mess it up, just don't mess it up. And so the tray came and I remember taking a cup and I was so excited, so energized that I wanted to get it knocked out as quick as possible. I didn't want to mess it up, so I quickly flipped the cup over. I've seen a lot of different ways in which you can drink the juice in the cup. Traditionally, you want to reach your mouth before you flip your cup. But I, that morning, decided that that was not the tradition I wanted to partake in. So I dumped the communion right on my white pair of corduroy pants. 
And so I had a stain that was there, and you'd be surprised if you haven't ever spilled a communion cup on yourself before in the middle of everything, how much time slows down and how much liquid is in each one of those individual <laughs> cups. And so I froze. I had the tray. I didn't know what to do. And I remember looking to my mom in my shame, my embarrassment, my failure, whatever it was, and I was so anxious and overwhelmed with what was happening to the point I wanted to cry. Uh, overwhelming, dramatic, I know, but it was. And I looked at my mom, and she probably doesn't even remember this, but I was like, what do I do? I didn't say it, but I kind of had that look of like, what do I do? And so calmly she turns and just says, just get another cup. <laughs> That thought had never crossed my mind. <laughs> my mind, I was to stand up in front of the whole church and say, I'm so sorry, I've ruined this special meal on my very first time at the table, and, and you all don't ever want me to come back. But instead, I was like, just grab another cup. And I did. I took the cup, knocked it out, passed it along as if nothing had happened. And so amidst all of the chaos... Miss everything that went wrong that morning, or everything that went seemingly wrong in my mind that somehow I still remember to this day, I still had a seat at the table. It's funny the things we remember, the moments in our lives that capture us, and it's always those special moments, and that communion that Sunday was special, not only because I messed up, but because I finally was a part of the story. Now, I'm going to be honest, though, I wish I could recapture the excitement and the anxiety that I had that morning, because I've noticed over time, every time, every Sunday, every Sunday that we have communion, there's an element, there's a part of me that normalizes the passing of the plate, the taking of the cup, and it's not intentional, but it becomes that routine, and so that element of excitement becomes a level of normalcy, and so something that is so powerful becomes something that is just a part of my Sunday. I've never heard anyone standing from a pulpit admit the normalcy of communion and how, how common it becomes and how we have to change that. Maybe you've experienced times like that where you, you, you come in here on a Sunday and I get it with kids, with everything going on, you pass the tray, you pass everything that goes on and it becomes just routine in your Sunday to make sure that you get things done because you're here, so you came for the show, so you need the snack, so let's get it going and you move it along. And it's hard for me to admit how often that happens. How often something so significant becomes so trivial in my mind. There are times whenever I feel so close to God that he's sitting next to me as I break the bread and I, pass the, and, I, and I take the cup and I pass the tray and it's a part of who I am. God is present and there are other times whenever he feels so distant that I question if he is present at all and yet I still partake. I still break the bread and I still take the juice as we pass it along and I hope and I know many of you have experienced similar feelings and similar moments, similar times in your story. Where you feel like God is present in this coming together, this communion meal that we are sharing is the most significant part of your day, your week, your month, whatever it is. But then there are other times when it just becomes something that we do instead of a people who we are. And this Sunday, it's, it, this, this morning, I want to talk about how significant in the story that we are invited into in hopes of capturing that element of power, that element of excitement that we have in joining in this story, in this meal that has transcended years and generations through all of the arguments, through all of the brokenness, people around the world today and throughout time have broken bread together and shared in a meal that we as followers of Christ, get to participate in and be a part of. Because we serve a God that is bigger than our brokenness, than our chaos, but he continues to invite us to the table and provide us spaces at that table. And that should give us hope. 
That should give us excitement and encouragement. And so this morning, I just want to touch briefly on what that can be and what we can do as followers to make sure that we continue to create a spirit of excitement and powerful moments within that communion service so that whenever it does become normal, we know that that is okay because God is still with us and he invites us to the table. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to Mark chapter 14. This is a passage that uh, you are probably familiar with, either this one out of Mark or uh, one out of Matthew, or, and, and many of each of the Gospels recounts this idea, of this, this element, this, this putting in place the communion that Jesus has. And so I'll begin reading in verse 22. And as they were eating, he took the bread, and after he blessed it and gave it to them and said, Take this as my body. And he took a cup, and we had given thanks to, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he preached to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink the kingdom, drink it new in the kingdom of God. If you're not familiar with this passage, you may have heard it read throughout communions or communion talks before, but if you're not familiar with where this is in the placement of Mark, this is toward the end of Jesus' ministry. It's the night that he is going to be betrayed and ultimately killed the following day, and so it is toward the end that he is beginning. He is sharing in this meal with his disciples on this Passover day. And what you see is them gathering together for this meal. And this meal is significant not just for us as followers of Christ, as Christians, but it's significant for uh, for Jesus and his disciples because it was a significant meal in their history. What they're celebrating there is called the Passover meal. And that's a meal that goes back 1,600 years to when Israel was in captivity um, under the rule of Egypt. And they were all slaves in Egypt. And maybe you've heard this story, Jesus sends Moses, or God sends Moses to the Pharaoh of Egypt, and he says, let my people go, and he says, he has the ten plagues that are there, and what comes out of that is that final plague is the death, the plague of the firstborn. And so God sends Moses, Moses tries to plead with with Pharaoh, but Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and it ultimately leads to the death of every firstborn. But Israel, and because they were God's people, God instituted what is called the Passover, where you uh, slaughter a lamb and you put the blood of the lamb over your doorposts and the, the angel of death would pass over their house and they would be spared. Their firstborn would live. And so as... Israel was drawn out of Egypt. It was drawn out in this Passover moment. They were brought out of captivity through this time. And so throughout Israel's history, each year they would gather and share in this meal and remember the time that God had set them free. The freedom that they found, the freedom that was present within, uh, within their story was there, and they, got to live, they were able to live in community with God as they were drawn into the wilderness And so Jesus is telling and breaking this bread, and it's a story that's significant for him and his disciples, and it's significant for us because we are now brought into this story. And he's reminding them of something that was, but at the same time, he's pointing to something that is bigger. You see, what we have also within our Old Testament, within this story of God, is Israel's wrestling with God throughout their history after they were freed. You see, the second that God passed over their homes and drew them out of Egypt, they were freed from slavery, but they spent the rest of their time as a people, and they continue to spend what it, to figure out what it means to be free. And so you see moments in Israel's history throughout our Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the moments of Israel's history where God is so close to his people, and in other times where God's people are so far from him. And yet, what you see throughout that is the presence of God in each one of those moments and those stories. And so what Jesus is here with his disciples is doing is throughout all that history, throughout all those moments of brokenness, throughout those times when they were close to God, they continually came back year after year and shared in this Passover meal. 
But Jesus does something different. Because Jesus knows what is about to come, and he talks with his disciples, and he says, this is my body, this is what is there, it's broken, give it to me. And he took the cup, and he said, this is what it is, and he is foretelling what is about to come. He's talking about what is happening, and he's laying down, he's laying down the foundation of what we celebrate every single Sunday we gather. In every moment of our lives, we are invited into the story and reminded of who God is and the freedom that was found not only for for Israel in Egypt, but the freedom that we now have because Christ laid down his life for his people. And so this meal that they were sharing was laying the foundation for the meal that we share every single time we gather. And he broke the bread and he took it. And he drank the cup. And what you see throughout the story of God's people is this is one of the first parts of the, the story that they began sharing together. In Acts chapter 4, it says when the, the, after everything, everybody came together, they began breaking bread together. When everybody was to, whenever the church gathered, they would break bread. And so what is encouraging for us is that this story, this history that's there, is one that doesn't start with us. And it doesn't stop with us. Instead, we're invited into a greater story that spans years and years. And so we, as God's people, get to participate in that. One interesting thing about this passage is it is sandwiched in two different stories of God, of Jesus and his disciples. Just above this passage in Mark uh, 14, the, just the very next section right above, I believe beginning in verse 17, Jesus is talking with his disciples. They're reclining together and sharing this meal together. They're beginning the elements of this Passover meal. And he says, one of you will betray me. And he tells them of what is to come, what is going to happen. And we know from our understanding that he's talking about Judas, but what he's saying is one of you who's with me, one of you who is sharing this meal with me is going to betray me. And yet he still had a seat at the table. And then you have at the very end of this, Jesus and his disciples go and they go to the garden and he says, you are all going to fall away from me. You're going to leave me in the, in the chaos that is about to come. You're going to leave me. And, G and Peter looks at Jesus and says, I will never do that. And Jesus turns and says, I'll tell you, Peter, before the rooster, rooster crows twice, you will betray me, or you will deny me three times. And yet the meal that they just shared, he still had a seat at the table. Because the meal that we share each Sunday, this communion that we gather with, it doesn't, isn't based on our merit or our ability to, ability to have it all together and have it all figured out because if it did, I should never take this meal. But instead, it's because of who Christ is and the sacrifice that was made and the blood that was shed that we are then invited into this story. Just as Israel was drawn out of Egypt, they were freed and spared because of the blood of the Lamb. We too are drawn out of our captivity and spared by the blood of the perfect Lamb. Christ died so that we can live in freedom with God. So that we can be a part of the story, so that we can share. So every Sunday, every moment of our lives is constantly pointing us to who God is and the fact that we have the ability to live with him and a part of his story and his people. And that's hard for us to grasp because whenever we think of freedom, we always think of, well, I'm not a slave, I'm not captive. It's what is this freedom that he's talking about? And what we see within these elements, within the sacrifice that Jesus did, is the freedom that we have isn't freedom in the way we think of it. Rather, it's freedom to be in community with God and his people and live in God's kingdom. Here and now, yes, we will die, yes, but we are freed from death because there's something else, there's something more. We are freed within everything. So you see Israel's story as they had this table, they were freed from Egypt, and we are freed from our sin and our death, and we are freed from the, the, the curse that brought, was brought upon all people because of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And that's powerful. 
That's incredible because no longer is it my merit that I live on, it's his. No longer is the, is the freedom that I seek is how well I can do, but rather I still have a seat at the table regardless of how well I do. And that's powerful. That's energizing. That's incredible to think about. But the question is, what do we do? What does that mean for us here and now? You see, communion, to, to me, talking about this table, this moment, is intimidating because how, who am I to talk into the lives of people who've done it before me thousands of times? Because this meal that we share is so intimate, it's so in individual that at times we miss out on the communal aspect of it. The fact that the people who went before me, the people who have shared in this meal before me, are setting the example so that I can see what it means to be a follower of God. And it's incredible to think about. There's a, a documentary on Netflix called Cooked. I love cooking. One of the things that I do, it, it, although I do get in trouble because I can spend hours cooking and yet take two minutes to eat the actual meal, and so it's a, it's a constant battle within our household, but whenever we, uh, but so there's a constant battle within our household, but in this documentary called Cooked, one of the uh, conversations that goes on is they're talking about what it's like to pass on and why it's so important to pass on the tradition of cooking to each subsequent generation. And one of the things that the, the lady that they were talking to says, is she says, every time we don't pass on that tradition, it's an active loss of knowledge. You can tangibly see how the skills of cooking deteriorate the further we get and the less we communicate it with each passing generation. And I think about that in our communion time, in our time together in this meal, is how often we share in this time together, but how little I know of your story, of why you are a part of this story, of your moment, your communion, why it's important to you, what energizes you, because we spend it so intentionally pulled away. And it's a great moment of remembrance, but the challenge is, is how do we create elements of conversation, not within the communion talk, but to continue that conversation outside of these walls? Why is it important to you? And another moment is, is that we have within a lot of this is it's a fast food culture we live in. I talked about how quickly I eat food, and I get in trouble for that. But how quickly on our Sunday mornings am I guilty of just passing the tray, passing the elements as quickly as I can? And so it's difficult to talk about this time together, but it's such an important part of our worship service. It's the central key to why we gather on Sunday mornings is breaking the bread and celebrating the Passover lamb that was given for us so that we can share in this time together. And the question becomes, how do we capture those powerful moments? I think it starts with slowing down, and I think it starts with finding ways of sharing our stories with one another. Because if we miss out on teaching the next generation what it means to be a part of this story, what it means to share and to sit at the table, we're actively losing ways of impacting the world around us. Because what's so powerful is it doesn't start with us in this room. It started years ago. And it's going to continue years beyond us. And it's how do we make an impact right now, knowing that the story that we are invited into is one that we all have a seat at the table. Regardless of the chaos that's going on, Christ calls us to share in a meal with each other and to break the bread and to drink the cup as a remembrance of him, but also as a celebration of the freedom that we have through him. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for all that you've done. Lord, I ask right now that you help us to, to find moments of celebrating who you are and celebrating the times that we have together. Lord, we ask for energy as we commune with one another, as we break the bread and we celebrate the freedom that we have in who you are. 
Lord, thank you for the time and the elements and the, the, the communion that we have. Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we ask that you help us to speak life into those around us and to be an encouragement every single day. It's in your sons that we pray. Amen. One of the things that I uh, have realized over the years is I am going to be spending the rest of my life learning about what it means to be a father, a husband, and a Christian. And so for us, the idea, of, for many of us, whenever we talk about this time together, we think about how well we can have it, to, how, how well we have it together before we can break the bread, before we can share in the communion with one another. But what's so beautiful is, yes, I am set free whenever I take on the faith in Christ, whenever I step into the waters and am baptized, I'm brought into this story. I'm brought into this moment where I can share in the meal. But one of the things about that story is I'm going to spend the rest of my life navigating what it means to be a part of God's kingdom. I'm never going to have it all figured out. I found out again three weeks ago that yes, even though I have a son, even though I have the title of father, I will be spending every moment for the rest of my life figuring out what it means to be a father. The title doesn't mean that it's not true, but the title doesn't mean that I have it all together. And that's what's so amazing about this communion is that we're invited into this larger story. But at the same time, we can come as we are because we have a seat with our Savior. So this morning, if you have a need, if you have something in your life that you are wrestling with, we want to invite you to come um, and sit at the feet of, uh, come and sit and pray with us. We ask that you, uh, if you have moments within all of that, we, we want you to know that God is present and that he wants you no matter what's going on in your life. So this morning, uh, if you have a need, come forward as we gather together and sing. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of my mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower. Bow down.
Good morning. It's a great day. Um, uh, Paul and uh, Jaton Kaspricks come forward uh, with a with a thank you for this congregation. Uh, they um, they truly and deeply appreciate all of the food and love that this congregation's given them, and even special donations for them. They want to thank this congregation and recognize that God is working through you in their lives. And um, so we want to recognize that this time. Okay. Uh, I believe life is more than survival. I believe the heart is more than an, a muscle. I believe we. I believe we can know right from wrong. I believe in hope and freedom. I believe my life ran. My, I, live, I believe my life can make a difference. I believe the message of the cross. What do you believe? Uh, that's coming from Romans 10, 9 through 13, and Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And uh, in addition to this prayer of thanks for the congregation, uh, we want to lift up um, Paul and Jaton in prayers. Um, they also have a family member that passed away in a vehicle accident. Uh, a young man, Louis Pe Peckrick, Peckhomery. And we just want to pray for this family at this time. This time of... Uh, physical struggles for them, this time of uh, grief and loss of a family member, but also this time in uh, the thankfulness of a uh, great Christian family. Will you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we, uh, we lift up Paul and Jaton to you, and uh, we... Uh, recognize the physical struggles they've gone through lately, and we ask for healing for that. And Lord, uh, uh, we're thankful that we've been able to be an impact on their life and to help them along the way. And we continue to lift them up on a daily basis. Lord, we ask that you be with Lewis, Lewis's family and Paul and Jaton as uh, they grieve his untimely passing, Lord, and we just pray that you be with them as, as they show the love of Christ to their family. 
It's these things we pray through our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning, church. My friend, Derek White, is back with us. Derek's been on the road working um, for a company that works all over the United States, and he's come down with some uh, his, uh, health issues. Um, he's actually having a, uh, <laughs> it's ironic, he's having a heart problem. He's really not having a spiritual heart problem. He's having a physical heart problem, and he always comes back home when that things go wrong in his life. And it's a very uh, humbling lesson for me that we always return home and seek guidance and help, and that's what Derek's doing today. Derek has got, uh, like I say, some health issues. He's uh, temporarily laid off. Um, he is homeless right now. He's broke, but he is very grateful for all this church has done for him and has helped him. And we're going to continue to do that. And right now, uh, we're just going to uh, go to God in prayer for Derek. And if you'll all join with me. Father God, we lift up Derek to you this morning. And we love him. And we are just so grateful for him, dear God. He has had so many things happen in his life, dear God, that would just ordinarily stop uh, someone to make him give up. And Derek is having a hard time right now with that. But dear God, he knows where his strength lies. He knows that's in you, and he is very grateful, and he feels blessed in, uh, at, at, at that perspective of it, dear God. But he needs help, and we need to help him. And we just pray. I pray this morning, God, for Derek, but I pray also for us, dear God, that we would reach out to Derek and that we would lift him up, and not only in prayer, but that we would see to his needs and that we would help him as, all, as, 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 as good as we can, dear God. Uh, we just thank you so much for your spirit that dwells in all of us. We're thankful for your word that teaches us, that we read. And we're thankful for you sending your son to save us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. When you hear about needs in the family, it makes us very grateful that there's a seat, as James talked about this morning. If you would stand with me as we read this scripture, we'll kind of pray this scripture over ourselves to know that there's never a bad time to do what is right, what is good. We see that when we do these things, it's uplifting to our brothers and sisters in the family. And so let's read this scripture together. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I know that there's a song up here that's Be Still and Know, um, but we're gonna sing a different song, I'm sorry to those in the back. I think we know this song without needing the book or the words. So we're gonna sing Blue Skies and Rainbows before we gather around the table this morning. I hope that's okay with everybody that I go off script. Skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see when my Lord is living in me. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we and flowers all blooming in springtime are works of the master I live for each day I know that Jesus is well and alive today he makes his home in my heart never will I be all alone since he promised me that about me. Father, thank you so much for the blue skies and the rainbows, for the green grass and the flowers. And Father, thank you for living in us. And Father, thank you for indwelling us and giving us strength, even when we're not sure where to find it. 
Father, we started uh, this service this morning um, reading from your word that hardships will come. Uh, and Father, as, as hard as that is for us to understand, you fill in the gaps when we don't think we have anything left. And we are so thankful for that. Father, we are thankful for our family, that as we gather around the table this morning together, we strengthen each other. Father, your table is so big, and when we gather at your table, our brothers and sisters surround us, and you're at the head, strengthening all of us. Father, we are so, so grateful. Father, I pray that our hearts and our minds are centered as we gather and we celebrate your gift of your son. In your son's precious name, amen. Please be seated. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the here? That's what it says it all, doesn't it? Um, thanks, Ty. Thanks for the songs of worship this morning. appreciate you. Thanks, James, for reminding us that uh, we have a seat at the table all together in communion. Um, I also want to say thanks to Morgan Wilson last week. He brought some thoughts to us about sacrifice. He said sacrifice is essential for life. Anything that sustains us, whether it's grain or meat, once was alive, right? And had to be sacrificed so that we could have our energy and be sustained. And Jesus ultimately sustains us. But as we come around the table this morning, the last few days, sacrifice has been on my heart and on my mind. It's been on all of your minds, I'm sure as we contemplate 20 years in our country, 20 years that started with a horrific day, horrible day. We see a dichotomy in, in sacrifice. We see two different routes. We see suicide bombers and hijackers and terrorists that would take 
take transportation services over in the United States and use them against fellow man to destroy life, to take away, to serve a purpose of hate. Just two weeks ago in Afghanistan, one of these suicide bombers sacrificed his life but he did it to kill over a hundred people in Afghanistan, including 13 service members. We look at those sacrifices that were meant for hate, and we also see the other side. We see our service members in the United States over there in Afghanistan serving, serving for freedom, serving, serving for security. I think about Flight United, uh, United Flight 93 on 9-11 20 years ago. And I think about Tom Beamer that was on the phone with the telephone operator. And him and the brave men and women on that, plight, that flight that saved other countless lives as the head was, uh, a plane was about to go towards Washington, D.C., and we don't know exactly where they were headed, but the White House, the Capitol building, and they, they sacrificed themselves. And they stood up in courage and bravery to protect the lives of others. So we see that side of sacrifice, sacrifice towards fellow man. There's been studies done that since that time in 2001, uh, the war on terrorism has resulted in upwards of uh, 890,000 lives, civilian lives, journalists, humanitarian workers, military lives. That's a lot of sacrifice, a lot of human sacrifice. I think about uh, some of you guys that have the daily sacrifice to go out in the jobs and, and risk during a pandemic becoming sick and getting your, your friends sick and your, your family sick. Friends like Chad Tyson serving as a first responder. Friends like Katie Ramirez serving as a nurse. All my teacher friends, they go to work every day not knowing that they could come home with with the, this pandemic and share it with their families. That's, that's, to me, that's sacrifice as well. But we're not, this, we're, not we're here to, to celebrate those sacrifices, but most importantly, we're here to celebrate the ultimate sacrifice that was given once and for all for the sins of the world. That's, that sacrifice is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I want to read a few scriptures that talk about his sacrifice and our time of communion together. John, first John, chapter one, starting verse two. The life appeared. We've seen it, and we testify to it. We proclaim, pro, proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we can confess our sins, 
He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Because of Jesus' blood, we're here together. He's here with us. I think that's the greatest miracle in all of this, is that Jesus' blood shed 2,000 years ago, not 20 years ago, but 2,000 years ago, still flows, still flows from the cross. And we can still claim his sacrifice and the forgiveness of our sins. And we can claim his sacrifice to have fellowship with one another. We can claim his sacrifice to have fellowship with God. That is amazing. The creator of the universe is here with us this morning. He promised that to us in his truth. Wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be there in the presence I want to say thank you to Kevin McKee last week who reminded us that worship and communion and being here in fellowship is more about godly activity than it is human creativity, human perspective. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is work within us. That's who we are standing before today. That's why we gather for communion around his table. Would you go with me in prayer? Father, we worship you in truth and spirit. With all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, we give you thanks for redeeming us through your blood, the blood of your son Jesus, the perfect spotless one, who was without sin and yet sacrificed himself so that we could once again have fellowship with you. The power in your blood is miraculous. You're an infinite and eternal God. Your salvation plan was and is perfectly carried out. Lord, help us to search the depths of our heart, to see what is there that might keep our spirit from connecting with yours. We confess our weaknesses of the flesh. Confess all of our doubts and fears, and we lay them at your feet this morning. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for giving your son to die on the cross, to go through a cruel death, even though he was without sin. He trampled our sin under his feet, and you commune with us around the table as your blood represents the fruit of the vine. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We accept, we accept your sacrifice. We pray that we can have fellowship one of another and also we can have fellowship with you this morning. We pray your, your power and your spirit flow through us as we commune together. You say, take and eat, this is my body that was broken for you. Would you partake of the body of Christ with me this morning? Would you continue your prayer with me, please? Lord, give us confidence in your resurrection power to stay in communion with you until we are with you in eternity. 
You're here with us in Holy Communion, listening to our hearts collectively and individually. Help us seek, Lord, how we can sacrifice. What can we sacrifice in your presence? What can we sacrifice in our lives that will bring us closer to you, that will help our fellow man, that will lift, lift others up, that will show the way to you and your love, your ultimate sacrifice, your love? How can we show you in our lives? We love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for the blood that was shed on the cross. Help us to feel and have confidence that there is no condemnation now that are those who are in Christ Jesus and accept your blood to cleanse us from our sins. We thank you so much, Lord, for your blood. We know it has all of the power of the Holy Spirit and of the Father in heaven to cleanse us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue to praise and worship the one that made the ultimate sacrifice, the one that before time began set out a plan to redeem us back to himself, the one whose blood flows through us, the Lord God in heaven, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the Lord of us all, and his son Jesus Christ. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, Yeah. 
just a quick word on behalf of the elders. I really want to thank you guys that led our service today. James, Ty, Will, thank you. Ty, going off script, bless me tremendously. You've got my permission any other time God leads you to do that. Okay, Ty, lead us in a closing scripture. Let's read this together. You will keep me in perfect peace, those whose minds are steadfast, because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock of eternity. How many times do we hear people say, my day is great whenever I have my cup of coffee, or have my 30 minutes of TV, or watch the Cowboys, or whatever else? Shouldn't our fill in the blank be when we have our time with the Lord, when the Lord is our and when people see that in us, they will adopt that same mindset. So go out into the world and make that fill in the blank the Lord. Have a blessed week.